do that to them. Well, good morning, church. Let me adjust this real quick. Oof, can't hear myself. There we go. Well, good, good morning to you. Happy Sunday. It is always a good thing to be together as God's people. And in this room, we have many different uh, stages, many different places in life, seasons that we're going through, struggles, delights, joys, trials. I just want to say from the very outset, if this is your first time or if you're a regular part of our church, you are most welcome here, no matter what you're going through. We're not disqualified by our struggles. We're not disqualified by our sin from receiving Jesus' grace. So let's stand together for our call to worship. Let me say this first. To all who are weary and need rest, to all who mourn and long for comfort, to all who are weak and need strength, and to all who sin and need a Savior. This church opens wide her doors with a welcome from Jesus, the friend of sinners. Our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 98. Let's pray these words together. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with a lyre. With the lyre and the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn, make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands, let the hills joy together. Before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with righteousness. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning. our voices, holy, holy.
presence of the Lord, we worship the one who is holy and high and lifted up. Holy, holy. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all thy works shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. John writes in the letter of 1 John. We can read this together. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the truth of darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we get fellowship with him. you pray with me? Lord, we stand here in this room filled with all sorts of things that should not be. There are parts of our lives that we wish were not true, but they are. Deaths that we've experienced, deaths of dreams, deaths of loved ones and friends, deaths of relationships. Lord, in this room, we have bitterness, some of us have depression. Some of us have hidden sins. I thank you, Lord, that these things do not disqualify us from receiving your grace. You are the one who says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Thank you, Lord, that you are the friend of sinners who most deeply wants us to come to you to bring our need, to stop trying to fix our own lives by ourselves, to stop trying to solve our own problems. And instead, just to pray to you, Lord, I'm yours, be with me. Lord, even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with us. Your rod and your staff, they comfort us. You prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies. You anoint our heads with oil, or our cups overflow. And so, Lord, we say with the psalmist, surely goodness and mercy, your goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. So, friends, this morning, hear what John says a little bit later in, in the book of 1 John. He says, see what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And indeed, we have been. We are. Let's sing together. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain for me.
Sing with me. He left his father's throne above, so free, so That was good. Welcome to church in Alaska this morning. It's a little bit chilly. I know Rick just turned it up, so we should be all right. Uh, aren't you happy the air conditioning is working now? A couple months ago, we didn't have that. So, uh, All right, today. So right after church today, Church at the Clusters. Um, if you have never been there before, there was a, was a group of, of severely disabled adults who uh, live in the home they call the Cluster Homes. If you walk out the front doors of the Y and just keep going straight down that road there, uh, you'll run into them. You can't miss it. Uh, it's a group that we dearly love and we minister to at least once a month. Uh, and so if you can make it over there, it's only about 15 minutes we spend. You can drive over there. You can walk over there. Either one is fine. Uh, but it is a special ministry in our church that I would highly recommend you be a part of. Um, Mother's Day, two weeks uh, we'll have children's choir along with a baby dedication uh, that week. And so if, uh, uh, if you want your kids involved in that, then let us know. Uh, normal week this week overall with Bible studies and things like that. Uh, next week we're having picnic in the park. And, and so if you, if you uh, could just bring your lunch with you and then we'll go over to Jeremy Gant and eat together right after uh, the service. Uh, all right, so announcement is... Uh, we've been running numbers in terms of what's busy, you know, where are, we, uh, where are people seated at and, 
and things like that. When the, the, traditionally, you say once you get to 80% full, then you need to add chairs or add a service. Uh, well, we're 80% full in that section. Not this morning, but typically we're 80% full just in this section. We have more chairs in that section than any other section, okay? But that's the section that always fills out, fills up. And I think that's because if people want to leave, they can. That's the quickest way out of here. Um, so if you're not worried about having to leave, uh, and I also think that those with, with younger children as well, that's a quick way to be able to, to get out if they're being fussy. So, um, but I would ask if, if some of those who normally sit over there, if you can, just move to any of these three other sections and, and you'll be fine. Uh, and there are exit doors as well. So there's a door there and a door back there. Um, but it does, get, it does get crowded. I think last week we were, uh, we were at 80% last week. The last couple of weeks has been at 80%. And so uh, if you're standing in the back and you come in, uh, when everybody's standing, this place looks absolutely packed, okay? And so um, we want to be hospitable to those who are visiting. And so typically, and again, not today, typically this section right over here is the section that doesn't fill for some reason. So thank you for your faithfulness. <laughs> um, all right. If you're visiting with us this morning, uh, there should be a card in the seat back pocket in front of your visitor's card. If you would fill that out and then you can give it to me at the end of the service. And we have a tithe and offering box there in the back and you can put it in there as well. Let's take a few minutes, maybe take a short-term mission trip all the way to the other side of the gym and, <laughs> and meet somebody you never met before. All right. Doesn't that sound good? All right, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's greet one another.
Let's sing together. Hallelujah. that again. is my life. I just love that, that whole song because it really does tell the gospel story in a very personal way that I was the one running far from you, like the prodigal son who said, I kind of don't, don't really want you, Father. I just want your stuff. And for us, it's so easy to fall into that, even as Christians, even as those who claim the name of Jesus, to just think, I just want the blessing. I don't really want a deep relationship with Jesus who calls me out on my sins, who tells me what to do. But friends, if Jesus is who he says he is, he is not just a teacher whose words we can take as kind of just advice. He is actually the Lord of all. And that's good news for us because he is not just the Lord of all, he is our protector. He is our shield. He is our fortress. We're going to sing this Martin Luther hymn together. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal Still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great. 
with me. Did we in our own strength confide our striving would be losing? We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Dost ask who that may be, Christ Jesus it is. Somebody asked during the welcome, so how many are these rows? What percentage? So they're about 65%. So we still have room, and we still have more chairs in, the, uh, in a warehouse. So we're fine. I'm going to read from Psalm 96 for our uh, pastoral prayer this morning. Uh, let's pray together. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name, proclaim good tidings of his salvation from day to day. Tell of his glory among the nations, his wonderful deeds among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are idols. But the Lord made the heavens, splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in holy attire. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Indeed, the world is firmly established. It will not be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all it contains. Let the field exult and all that is in it. Then all the trees of the forest will sing for joy. Before the Lord, for he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. Our Father, how grateful we are to have a faithful God. Not one that we cower down to in fear, but one who's our Father. A loving, heavenly Father, compassionate and merciful to those who are his own. Thank you that our wrath has been taken by Jesus Christ. Thank you that he has paid our sin debt in full so that we might be able to come to the throne of grace with confidence knowing that you will receive us. Father, this morning as we work through these first six of Jacob's sons, thank you for the poignant examples they are of how relevant this is to our life. 
and even for the, the meat of the word. Thank you for having to study hard. You said study hard to show yourself approved by you as workmen who do not need to be ashamed because we can rightly divide the word of truth. So I ask for your help to do that to your glory. Build up your kingdom, equip your saints, and save the lost. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 49. Genesis 49, almost there. This is the home stretch of the book of Genesis. We started September 11th, 2022. And in just a few weeks we will be finishing. And I have to admit that hearing Jacob's final words from his deathbed is, is very sobering. I, I recognized yesterday that next year is my 40th anniversary from high school graduation. I'm like, 40 years? And then I thought, wow, what an advantage that is. I, I qualify now to be one of those older guys that begins my sentences with, that ain't nothing. When I was your age, or back in the day, or I remember when, or you guys don't have it as bad as you think you do, you should know what we grew up in. Well, that's where we are in Genesis 49. Jacob is, is going back to those days when his sons were younger. Uh, the famine has, has been over at this point for about 12 years. Prosperity has, has returned to, to Egypt, and it certainly has not passed them by in Goshen. So for the past 17 years, Jacob has enjoyed his whole family being together there in Goshen. His, his favorite son, Joseph, is the prime minister. Uh, the people are growing. By the time they leave Egypt, there's going to be about over 200 million, or I'm sorry, not 200 million, 2 million of them. But these are Jacob's final hours. We are coming into Genesis 49, and, and Jacob is on his deathbed. This is the third deathbed scene, actually. Remember two weeks ago? where Jacob was, had, Joseph came to him and, and Jacob made Joseph swear to, to not bury him in Egypt, but to take him back to Canaan. And remember last week we saw that the, the second deathbed scene, and in the second deathbed scene, we, Joseph uh, put his two sons in front of him, the older to his right and the younger to his left, and, and Jacob purposely switched hands. He put his right hand on the younger son and, and his left hand on the older, and that was that deathbed scene, and today we, and next week, we're going to see the final deathbed scene. Now, I really struggled with this passage, and if you're still using your, your Genesis journals, um, the plan was to preach all 33 verses of this this week, and there is no way that we could have done that. Um, and so, so we're just going to go through the first six sons uh, that are mentioned here. Uh, and that's what Jacob does. He summons his sons to him. Uh, to come to him and pronounce his final, and I put blessings on the title in, in quotes because they're not necessarily blessings, uh, but prophecies. So rather than reading the whole passage, we're just going to go a little bit at a time. Actually, you know what? We can do the first 15 verses, uh, and then we'll come back to it. Uh, Genesis 49, beginning in verse 1. Then Jacob summoned his sons and said, Assemble yourselves that I may tell you what will befall you in the days to come. Gather together and hear, O sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel, your father. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power. Uncontrolled as water, you shall not have preeminence, because you went up to your father's bed. Then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are implements of violence. Let my soul not enter into their counsel let not my glory be united with their assembly, because in their anger they slew men. In their self-will they lamed oxen. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will disperse them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Judah, your, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down to you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He couches, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion, who dares rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from him, from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. He ties his foal to the vine, his donkey's colt to the cho choice vine. He washes his garments in wine and his robes 
in the blood of grapes. His eyes are dull from wine and his teeth white from milk. Zebulun will dwell at the seashore and he shall be a haven for ships and his flank shall be towards Sidon. Issachar is a strong donkey lying down between the sheepfolds. When he saw that a resting place was good and that the land was pleasant, he bowed his shoulder to bear burdens and became a slave at forced labor. Now, if you're like me, the first time I read through that, I thought, what in the world is this talking about? Right? There's a lot of illustrations, a lot of analogies in here, lots of prophecy in here. And I think it's funny, a lot of the the pastors, I noticed, they actually do Genesis chapter 48 and 49 together in one sermon. I mean, there's no way you could do that. And, and so my thought was we could do 49 in one shot, and it might take us three. I think it's just going to be two, but boy, there is so much in here. And I thought we was, would not do it justice without going through these one at a time. So let's do that. Verse 1, then Jacob summoned his sons and said, Assemble yourselves that I may tell you what will befall you in the days to come. Gather together and hear, O sons of Jacob. Listen to Israel, your father. So he's calling his sons to tell them what will befall them, he says. In other words, this is what God is going to do with them and and their descendants. And these prophecies ultimately are Jacob's last significant act of his life. You know, we've called uh, Genesis the book of beginnings or the book of first. Well, even here we see a first you realize this is the first time that conscious prophecy is spoken by a man in the Bible. Now, it's not the first time we've seen prophecy, right? We saw it all the way back in Genesis 3 when when God said the seed of the woman would crush the head of the the serpent. You go, well, that was a prophecy. Well, it was a prophecy. It wasn't a prophecy made by human lips. It was God literally speaking to Satan. Well, God also prophesied prophesied to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob But this is the first prophecy that a man makes. He says, these are the things that are going to befall you. So as Jacob begins, he identifies himself both as Jacob and as Israel. Let's just think about that for a second. What does Jacob mean? Deceiver, manipulator, supplanter. Israel is one who strives with God or one who wrestles with God. So in his mind, he recognizes that God has made him Israel, but he also acknowledges that there's a constant battle between the new Israel that God has made me and the old Jacob that's still inside of me. And we can all relate to that, right? We've got this battle between our old sinful nature and this new heart that God has given us. That battle is really the story of Jacob's life. Remember, Jacob is the one who tricked his older brother out of his birthright. Jacob is the one who deceived his father into giving him his older brother's blessings. And and yet, before Jacob was born, God told his mom, Rachel, that the older, Esau, would would serve the younger, Jacob. Now, I don't know if they manipulated things to try to make God's will happen, but what ended up happening is deception and sin abounded, and where deception and sin abounded, the grace of God abounded even more. There was nothing in Jacob to earn God's favor. And yet God chose him and God renamed him. And so as Jacob gathered his sons together, you would think that he would speak to them in birth order because it seems like that's kind of been the general tenor, right, when we see these boys being talked to. But, but he only does that with the first four sons. And then it's just a bit jumbled as far as the order is concerned. And so what we're going to do today is is we're going to go through Leah's six sons, which are the first six sons to be mentioned. And the firstborn is Reuben. And so we're going to look at each of these sons. So number one, Reuben, the far-reaching consequences of sin. Okay, to characterize Reuben, you would say the far-reaching consequences of sin. Now, if you remember, Reuben is the first son of Leah. He's the first son overall. And as the firstborn, he would be the leader of the pack. As firstborn, he's entitled to twice the inheritance of his brothers. And so look at verse 3. Jacob says, Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might in the beginning of my strength, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power. That's like saying, Reuben, you're my pride and joy. You know, I'm around you and you just strengthen me. You have the highest place of honor in our family. And Reuben, he's got to be on cloud nine. He's like, wow, look what my father is saying about me. And then you get to verse four. 
uncontrolled as water. You shall not have preeminence. Because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. This is like the rug being swept out from underneath him. He goes from preeminent and significant to insignificant. And the reason is he's uncontrolled like water. What does it mean to be uncontrolled like water? Well, in his specific case, he talked about his father's bed or his his father's couch. He he had a problem with self-control. His sexual passions were unbridled. He, he slept with his father's concubine, Bilhah. Paul, when he talked about this in the New Testament, Paul said this is a sin that even the Gentiles don't commit. He's uncontrolled as water. Some compare Reuben to water and that he would take the form on whoever he was with. So if he was with sailors, he'd cuss like a sailor. If he was with Christians, he'd say things like, God bless you, praise the Lord, God is good. Why? Because he's uncontrolled like water. But I think the bigger point that Jacob is making is that there are far-reaching consequences of sin. And what we're going to see here is that the consequences aren't just on him. The consequences are on his descendants. And so in these prophecies, Joseph, or sorry, not Joseph, Jacob is not speaking uh, just to his sons. The you here refers to descendants. So in Reuben's immediate sense, then he loses the advantage of being the firstborn son. He loses all the privileges of that. But but as time goes on, and and this is really interesting, you realize neither Reuben nor his descendants would ever excel in Israel? None of them would. From the tribe of Reuben, there's no priest, there's no kings, no heroes, no famous names. Why? Why? Because he lacked self-control and he defiled his father's bed. This is a classic example of the first being last. Reuben, you're, you're forgiven, but you'll also be forgotten. The world's not going to know you. Now, some people will, will take a text like this, and, and it's been really popular, I, I think maybe five years ago, more so than now. But they talk about generational curses. Have you heard that before? These generational curses will say, well, the sins of my forefathers have cursed me to this day, and so I, I just, I can't get ahead. I can't, nothing can, you know, spiritually speaking, I'm, I can't uh, overcome these sins and stuff like that. And, and, and that's just not true. I mean, a lot of you guys are like me. You're the first one to become a Christian in your family. <laughs> it's a generational curse. If it's a generational curse, there's no new Christians in families. But look what Ezekiel said, Ezekiel 18, verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, What do you mean by using this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying the fathers eat sour grapes, but the children's teeth are set on edge? In other words, because of what the fathers are eating, it, it directly affects the kids. As I live, declares the Lord, you are surely not going to use this proverb in Israel anymore. Behold, he says, all souls are mine. The soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine. The soul who sins will die. You see what this is saying? Your sin is on you. I've got people that'll come in, they're 45, 50 years old, and they're still talking about what some teacher told them when they were in second grade. And I'm like, dude, you're 45. Like at some point, you gotta go, you know, I would need to take responsibility. And as the text goes on, Ezekiel speaks about these families who have really godly dads and ungodly sons, and and some families have ungodly sons and godly dads. Look how he concludes, Ezekiel 18, verse 20. The person who sins will die. The son will not bear the punishment for the father's iniquity, nor will the father bear the punishment for the son's iniquity. The righteousness of the righteous will be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself. The guy who discipled me used to say, God does not have grandchildren, only children. It's a sobering thought. Just because you're a Christian, there's no guarantee that your children will come to faith in Christ. That does not mean you don't have a responsibility. We have a huge responsibility. 
God has called us to teach them and to train them and to model godly behavior before them and to be joyful. It's God's responsibility to save them. We need to teach them God's word, share the gospel with them, bring them to church, right? But God's the one who saves them, not us. I, I never saw my dad pray. Never saw my dad go to church. I think maybe a wedding or something. Never saw my dad read his Bible. My dad never quoted from the scriptures. He never disciplined me in godly ways. So you can say, I, I didn't become a believer because of my dad. I became a believer in spite of my dad. Why? Because of God's grace. Same way everybody else became a believer, whether you had godly parents or not. And my dad became a believer about six months before he died. And as he was on his deathbed, I think Christina was with me. We were talking to him. And I read John eleven twenty five. 25. Look what it says. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And then Jesus asked the question, do you believe this? I said, Dad, do you believe this? And he said, yes. I said, the promise then is that you will live even if you die. You know, one of the last sentences my dad ever said was in answering this question. He said, that's the best part of it all. I agree. Reuben is a reminder of the consequences of sin. But, But more than that, he's a reminder of the amazing grace of God that saves a wretch like you and me. Speaking of wretches, let's talk about number two, Simeon and Levi. They are the brothers in wickedness. And so Simeon and Levi, they are the second and third sons of Leah and the second and third sons overall. When, when Simeon, now you got to picture, these boys, are, they just heard what, what Jacob said to, to, uh, um, to Reuben, right? Okay, so Reuben, he, he, the preeminence is gone, firstborn stuff is gone. And so they're probably sitting there like on the bench like Tom Brady when Br- Drew Bledsoe got hurt. They're probably going, ooh, now is my chance, Okay. And so, wow, how exciting they must, excited they must be. Verse 5, Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are implements of violence. Oh, man, he, he, he groups them together. You know why he groups them together? They were trouble when they were together. They took matters into their own hand when they were together. When, when Dinah was raped by Shechem, their anger really showed. And listen, no, nobody is okay with what Shechem did. Okay, nobody. But it was their overreaction to Shechem's sin that brought about this negative prophecy from Jacob. Remember Shechem, he's the one who, he, he raped Dinah and then he said how much he loved her and he wanted to marry her and Simeon and Levi concocted this murderous plan. They said, well, you, you can marry Dinah if all the male Shechemites are circumcised. So he, he's the leader, so he gets them all circumcised. And then it says on the third day, third day, so pain would have been at its peak, they went into the city and killed every male. And then the other brothers came in and looted the city. And they seized their animals, they seized their wealth, they seized their women and their children. And remember Jacob, he was not happy about how the behavior of his sons made him look to the people of the land. Look at verse 6, look what he says. Let my soul not enter, enter into their counsel. Let not my glory be united with their assembly, because in their anger they slew men, and in their self-will they lamed oxen. This is really important. The Hebrew word for anger is the same word used for nostrils. It, it, it speaks of like that, that heavy breathing when, of somebody who's, who's enraged, and they, they just, you've seen that before, right? Someone who's so furious that they're out of control, that they, they act according to their flesh. And, and Jacob says, in your anger, you slew men. That's, that's Simeon and that's Levi. And it wasn't enough that they just killed men. They, they also lamed oxen. In other words, they, they, they cut their tendons. So they couldn't get water or food. What could they do? Die. Just this horrific, long death. Jacob continues, verse 7. 
Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will disperse them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. He's going to curse them. In other words, he's going to judge them. He's going to condemn them. You know what I see in here? Jacob doesn't excuse their sins like many parents do. Oh, he's just tired. He condemns them. He, he blames them for their sin. And listen, this is more than a one-time mistake. This is, this is who they were. You ever heard the story about the rattlesnake that was trapped in a bag? Guy comes along and, and he's like, oh, I wonder what's in this bag. And he opens the bag and, and the snake is in there and he goes, hey, could, could you let me out of the bag? And he looks down and says, rattling. He's like, oh, no, I, I am not letting you out of this bag. He's like, oh, please, could you please let me out? I'm dying in here. It's so hot. I just, if you could just let me out, I would be so grateful for you. And the guy goes, all right. And he reaches in the bag, and as he reaches and grabs him, grabs the snake, snake bites him. He's like, hey, what would you do that for? He said, I'm a snake. I'm a rattlesnake. That's what I do. But could you please let me out of the bag? He said, no way. I'm not going to let you out of the bag. He said, please, could you let me out of the bag? It's hot in here, and I, I'm not going to bite you again. And the guy says, all right, fine. I'll let you out of the bag. And he goes in to grab the snake, and it bites him again. What would you do that for? I'm a snake. It's what I do. I won't do it again. That's Simeon and Levi. Their anger is who they were. This was not just a one-time happening with Dinah. Their anger, Jacob said, is fierce. Their wrath is cruel. And because of this, he, he prophesies that you're going to be dispersed. You're going to be scattered all over the territory. And guess what? They did. You, you get to the book of Joshua, and, and you see that the Simeonites, they're just continually scattered all over the place until eventually they're absorbed into Judah. Well, what about the tribe of Levi? Well, Levi also, remember, they were scattered as well. The Levites didn't have land for themselves. What did they have? They had the Lord. He was their portion. And so because of that, these, they became the priests, the, Le, the Levitical priesthood. And so they, they were scattered among the tribes in order to carry out their religious duties. So even in these angry brothers, you see the grace of God. Even though Simeon and Levi wouldn't ever possess their own land, you see how gracious God was to them. And I think Levi is the most obvious example of this. No inheritance Levi gets. God is going to be their portion. God is their inheritance. And yet from the tribe of Levi, you get these great leaders, guys like Moses and Aaron and Phinehas and Eli and Ezra and John the Baptist. Even for Simeon, you go, wow, there's, you can see the grace in this is that they were absorbed into Judah, which meant that they were kept from the general apostasy of Israel. And they survived and prospered a lot longer than Israel did. And I look at these boys and I think, wow, isn't it encouraging to know that God's judgment on sin can be turned into blessing, which is Romans 8, right? All things work together for good to those who love God, those who are called according to his purposes. Even these evil things, these wicked things, these angry things, cruel things, even those things God can use for good. And so we get to number three, Judah, the pride of lions. Now, as Jacob is turning to Judah, Judah is probably expecting a similar judgment to what his other three brothers got. Right? He heard that what his dad said to Reuben, and, you know, Reuben's problem was a problem of sexual sin, uncontrolled as water. And, well, Judah wasn't free from sexual sin, remember? Judah impregnated Tamar. Tamar was his dead son's wife. He thought he was doing the old innocent thing of just sleeping with a prostitute. Remember, Judah is the one that suggested they sell Joseph. Let's at least make a little money off of them, guys. Look at verse 8. Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies, and your father's sons shall bow down to you. Now, there's a bit of wordplay here in verse 8. The name Judah literally means praise. And so he says, hey, praise, your brothers are going to praise you. His descendants are going to have preeminence over his enemies. His descendants are going to have preeminence over his brothers. 
And we see that in the short term because Judah takes preeminence during the divided kingdom. But there's also one coming along the, the son of David, the one who's from the tribe of the, the lion from the tribe of Judah. He's the one that will be slain for the sins of the world, and he's coming back. And so the greatest enemy, death, is, is going to be gone. And there's going to be no more sin and no more sorrow and no more sickness and no more death and no more pain. And that, that, that last enemy, death, is literally abolished. Well, who does that? Judah's lion does that. Look at verse 9. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He couches, he lies down as a lion, as a lion who dares rouse him up. Judah is a, is a young lion. And you know, young lions, they're full of courage and strength, sometimes foolishly so. The young lions do the hunting for the older lions. They're at the top of the food chain. And, and so the imagery here is, is that of a young lion that tracks down his prey and then he seizes it and he kills it and, and then he drags it up to his den and, and the whole den feeds on it and then they rest. I remember Caleb Colucci and I were in South Africa. We were on a, a, a safari tour and, and we, we pull alongside and, and, uh, and, the, and the driver stops and right in front of us, couldn't have been more than 15, 20 feet away, there was a pride of lions eating a zebra. And, and it was, they had a bunch of baby ones, so they're white lions and a bunch of little cubs, and, and they're in the entrails. I mean, they're in this thing, and, and, and they see us come, and they pull their head up, and it's just blood. And then you see the, the, the older lions, the, the, the young ones that are, uh, you know, the hunters and stuff, and their bellies are so big, and they're just laying like, oh, well, I can't believe I just ate all that. This is the image that he's given. The, the young lions, they track down, they seize, they, they kill, and then they eat, and it's like, whew, satisfied. It's the image of what Jesus did for us. He tracked down sin. He seized sin. He killed sin. And, and his mission now is complete. He's, he's fully satisfied, and he's seated at the right hand of his father. In verse 10, the scepter, Jacob says, shall not depart from Judah nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. The, the scepter is a, is a sing, symbol of kingship. The, the scepter is what the, the king holds in his right hand while, while he's on the throne. And the fact that he, it, will never, it will never depart is saying that there's going to be an eternal king in Judah. Well, we know who that king is. It's King Jesus. He'll never be impeached. He'll never be voted out. He'll never be overthrown. And and that imagery of the staff between his feet goes back to the lion who has the prey between his feet. And and I I told Caleb, one of the the, uh, the lions was laying literally like right next to us. And I said, hey, I heard if you rub his belly, he'll be really happy. He's like, no, you don't rouse him, right? You're not getting it out until Shiloh comes. What does that mean? Well, there's probably as many interpretations to this as anything I've ever read before. I believe this is the second coming. Shiloh is a proper name for the Messiah. To put it simply, it's like everything belongs to him. You can't take anything from him. And when he comes back, he's coming back to claim what's rightfully his. Peoples at the, at the end of verse 10 there speak about nations. All nations, all peoples will be subject to Subject to Christ. We see that same thing in the New Testament as well, right? Philippians 2, look at verse 9. For this reason also God highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Everybody will one day bow the knee to Jesus. In Revelation 5, we see that every tribe and people and tongue and nation will be subject to Jesus. All will surrender to him. Verse 11, he ties his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He washes his garments in wine and his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are dull with wine, his teeth white from milk. Now, this prophecy is a prophecy, prophecy of great prosperity in Judah. Grape vines are going to be so abundant that they're going to be used for hitching posts. 
wine is going to be so abundant. It's going to be like water. They just wash with it. And there's a lot of different ways that these verses are explained. Some say, well, his robe is stained with blood. His eyes are darker than wine. And speaking of, of the judgment to come, others say that there's just so much abundance in Judah that it, it will seem like their eyes will be red or bright because they have so much wine and their teeth are going to be so white because they have so much milk. I like what Steve Lawson said. Listen to this quote. He says, this is the first time I have ever preached these verses. Now, if you know Steve Lawson, uh, he is, he's been preaching for over 50 years. He's probably the premier expositor uh, in the world right now. He says, this is the first time I've ever preached these verses, and thank God they will be the last. He said, I preached through Genesis chapter by chapter and verse by verse, and I have no plans to do this again. Listen, there have been much easier texts to preach than this one is. This is not the milk of the word. It's the meat, but it's not filet mignon meat. This is beef jerky meat. This one requires some chewing. Number four, the fourth son is Zebulun. Zebulun, the one with waterfront property. Now things start to change up a little bit here. We, we just went through Jacob's uh, four sons of Leah, but Zebulun is Leah's sixth son. Okay, he, he was the tenth son of Jacob overall. Look at verse 13. Zebulun will will dwell at the seashore, and he, and he shall be a haven for ships, and his flank shall be towards Sidon. Now, this prophecy is close to 500 years away yet. This is after the Egyptian bondage. This is after the wilderness wanderings. Zebulun, you get waterfront property. And he did, sort of. Zebulun will dwell by the Mediterranean Sea. You can literally translate it, not at the seashore, but toward the seashore. So Zebulun is actually about 10 miles inland. It's between the Sea of Galilee and the Mediterranean Sea. So because it's between these two massive um, bodies of water, it's a prosperous place. It's a trade route from the Mediterranean to the Galilee. And, and this is prime location to prosper. It, but it's not like the, the gold rush days or you know, going out to California or whatever where, where they just claim land along the way. God gave them land a different way. I thought this was interesting. Look at Joshua 18. How did God give them land? It says, then the men arose and went, and Joshua commanded those who went to describe the land, saying, go and walk through the land, describe it, and return to me. Then I will cast lots before you, or for you here before the Lord in Shiloh. So the men went and passed through the land and described it by cities and seven divisions in a book. And they came to Joshua to the camp at Shiloh, and Joshua, look what it says, cast lots for them in Shiloh. Okay, before the Lord, and there Joshua divided the land to the sons of Israel according to their divisions. 500 years later, they cast lots. 500 years after this prophecy, they rolled dice. And the land fell exactly as God said they would. Zebulun would be a place for ships to be able to come in and find rest. God bless Zebulun. He put them in the midst of a great trade route. This was God's hand in their lives. The, the tribe of Gen Zebulun was actually noted for its faithfulness to David. Zebulun supplied uh, the largest number of soldiers to David's army. More than any other tribe, it was Zebulun. Look at number five, Issachar. Issachar, the retired donkey, we'll call him. Issachar was born before Zebulun. But Jacob calls him after Zebulun. He was Jacob's ninth son overall. And look what it says about him. Issachar is a strong donkey. Would that be a compliment? I think so. The strong donkey worked hard. The strong donkey carried heavy loads. This was a prophecy of the time when the judges would, uh, would come. Uh, when the tribe of Issachar fought against the Canaanites and, and they did it with everything they had, they were all in. Uh, the other tribes, they were slow to battle, but not Issachar. Well, that's good, right? Well, yeah, it is good, but not necessarily for him. Look at verse 14. Issachar is a strong donkey lying down between the sheepfolds. What does that mean? Issachar was lazy. It's a picture of laziness. He's not this, no longer this strong, hardworking donkey. He's on the sidelines. 
He's no longer actively participating in the battle. He, he's taking early retirement. He's got the attitude of, I, I put my time in and it's somebody else's turn now. This is the idea of a person who starts strong but can't finish. Look, look how the next verse explains it in more detail, verse 15. When he saw that a resting place was good and the land was pleasant, he bowed his shoulder to bear burdens and became a slave at forced labor. Issachar wanted the good life, and God gave it to him. But he got so used to the good life that he couldn't go back and fight those hard battles. And so therefore, this strong donkey had to kneel in subjection to a, a foreign oppressor. This foreign oppressor would put a yoke around his neck and enslave him, and, and he just gave up. So Issachar was strong, but he was lazy. Issachar enjoyed the good land that God gave him, but he wouldn't strive to keep that good land. And so because of that, he got carted off and forced into slavery when the Assyrians overtook Israel. Issachar reminds me a lot of, of those who think they can just pray some prayer and just cruise into glory. And they just lose the will to fight. They don't work out their salvation. You ever, you ever have somebody you work with that they stay busy looking busy, but they don't really do anything. It's not that they're not capable. It's just that they think that's somebody else's job. And as a church, I just think we, we need to work together. right? We need to do what God has called us to do together, like all of us. There's a joke that says, you know, as a pastor, I'm paid to be good. The rest of you are good for nothing. And yet week in and week out, you, the good for nothing, are counseling. And you're setting up the gym. And you're working in the nursery. And you teach. And you pray. And, and you sing. And you clean. The, the people of God are visiting people in the hospital. You're leading small groups. You're making meals. You're, you're calling people you haven't seen in a while or texting them. You write letters. You're hospitable. You give money. You fill up baby bottles with change. You fold bulletins. All the sound and video stuff, like somebody's doing all of that. You're organizing events. And whether you're organizing events or, or encouraging missionaries or providing refreshments, you're good for nothing. You, you do it for free. Thank you for that. We don't say that often enough. Thank you. Hey, I'm the only full-time staff to a church of about 250 people. Just me. There's no way this happens without you. You're not Issachar. Well, some of you might be Issachar. As in general, you're not Issachar. What a special church we have. Galatians 6, verse 9, look what it says. Let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of the faith. And so if there is breath in your lungs, lungs and there is work to do, Issachar was a strong donkey who used to work hard, and then he got used to vacation living, and it cost him dearly. Let not that ever be said of us. So how do we apply this? Three things. Uh, number one, and I made this really personal as we went to, as just looking at these guys, is what we see, especially in the first few, is we see their sin. And so the first point is deal with your sin biblically. You know, looking at these sons of Jacob is a reminder to all of us that there may be consequences to your sin even after you've repented, even after you've confessed, even after you've been forgiven. Maybe you're angry like Simeon and Levi. Maybe you, you have sexual sin like Reuben and Judah. Maybe you're trying to look busy without really doing anything. Like deal with it biblically. Confess it. And, and listen, when you confess, don't use words like but, if, or maybe. Okay? Don't... I'm really sorry, but, but you got to understand, you make me so mad when you do that. 
That but there, you've just ruined it. You're saying, I'm really sorry, but it's your fault. Or we might say, hey, I'm really sorry if I offended you. In other words, I don't really feel guilt about what I've done. I don't think I've sinned. But if for some reason you think I have, well, then fine. Then I confess that to you. Don't say maybe. You know what? Maybe you're right. You know what the better thing is? is You're right. I'm wrong. Confess it. Be specific. And then ask the question, will you forgive me? And then wait. Is anybody like not like long silences, long pauses? This is the time to wait for the long pause, to wait it out. Because here's what we usually do. Will you forgive me? I mean, I understand if you won't because I know I did something really bad, so I don't really want you to, you know, I don't want you to rush through this decision. No, just wait. Just wait. Will you forgive me? And, and then understand that once you grant forgiveness and once forgiveness is there, like just know this as a family, there are four things that, that we're going to say. If you say, yes, I forgive you, you're, you're saying, number one, I will never bring this up again and hold this against you. I am relinquishing my right to ever use this against you again because I forgive you. Number two, you're saying, I'm not going to let my mind dwell on this. I'm not going to marinate in this stuff. I'm not going to sit there and let this. Every time this comes to my mind about what you did to me and you did to me, I'm going to purposely make the decision to remove that thought and replace it with something else. So I'm not going to hold this against you. I'm not going to dwell on it. Number three is I'm not going to tell other people about it. Right? When, when you sin against God, does he, does he forgive you? Yes. I mean, when you confess, he forgives you. Like, is he sitting in heaven going, hey, Michael, Gabriel, come here. Did you see what Josh Head did the other day? I mean, I forgave him and all. He's an idiot, though, isn't he? Of course he's not doing that, right? He's not telling others about it. You're forgiven. And the last thing, number four, is I will never um, let, allow this to hurt our relationship. Okay, I'm not going to hold this against you. I'm not going to dwell on it. I'm not going to tell others about it. I'm not going to let this ruin hurt our relationship. You realize nowhere in Scripture are we called to forgive and forget. In fact, if you forgive and forget, there's something wrong with you. You either have Alzheimer's or you have amnesia. We're not created to forget. We're created to choose not to remember. That's what God does for us. That's what makes forgiveness such a special gift, doesn't it? So number one... Deal with your sin biblically. Number two, find a place of purposeful ministry. Don't be lazy. God has so blessed us. We live in America. People immigrate to us. You know that? People escape their countries to come to us. Of course you know that. You know, have you ever been to a U.S. embassy overseas? Every morning, lines are just packed there. Just packed all the way around the, the, and I want to say the building, all the way around the compound. Lines are just, they're just people over and over and over again. They have these appointments, and they just want to get into America. America, a place where if you want a job, then you can get one. If you want education, you can get it. We, we can worship without fear of persecution. We have churches for ch- uh, choices for church. And, and God has placed you here. You are so blessed by God, and as long as God has you breathing air here, then there's work for you to do. And so I would simply ask you, what is your ministry? Where where can you put your hand to the plow? And we need help, right? A number of different places. We need more small group leaders. We need more help on our setup and our teardown teams. We need more counselors. We need more uh, men's group teachers. And I would simply say, find a place of purposeful ministry and then get to work. And maybe today, maybe today, right afterwards, you know, people are stacking chairs, grab one of these dollies, start rolling chairs in, come up and help with this. We go to the cluster homes right after this. Go over there, walk over there, be an encouragement to people who, you might be the only visitor they get this whole month. Just something, do something today. Find a place of purposeful ministry. Number three, finally, remember where your help comes from. You know, an advantage that we have that none of the sons of Jacob had is that we have the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. We have the comforter that they didn't have. We have the teacher, the encourager, and the one who would convict us of sin. 
We, we have strength because of the Spirit to stand for Christ. Because of the Spirit, we have power not to give in to temptation. He has literally, quite literally, given us everything we need for a life of godliness. We literally lack nothing for holy living. Remember where your help comes from. You don't have to do this in the flesh. Now, maybe you're here and you've never trusted Christ. You don't have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. We read in our Sunday school class this morning, I beg you on behalf of God, be reconciled to Christ. I beg you. Repent of your sins. Trust in what Christ has done. He, he died literally as your substitute. He died so you won't have to. Everyone who believes literally has eternal life. Father, thank you for these sons of Jacob. Thank you for the example we see in, in these boys and, and how we compare so easily to so many of them. Father, I know that some are, are dealing like Reuben did with the far-reaching consequences of his sin. I thank you that you forgive, that you long to forgive. Pray that they will walk in that forgiveness. I pray for those who are like Simeon and Levi who are just known as angry men, angry women. God, may that not be true of us. I thank you for Judah and the one who is the lion from the tribe of Judah, the one who makes all things new. Father, pray that as believers we would walk in him. Pray for those who don't yet know him. Today would be their day of salvation. Father, be pleased with our singing in response to what we've heard. May it go up as a fragrant offering to you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, let's stand as we sing together. Got a couple songs we're going to close with today. All the good work that we do is just flowing from what God has done for us in Christ. We forgive others because Christ has forgiven us. Christ has forgiven us a debt that is so much bigger than we could ever owe anyone else, that anyone else could ever owe us. We have done far worse to Jesus, to God than any one person can, so we can forgive out of the abundance of the forgiveness we've been given. As we close, we're just going to remember this story, this glorious story again, of what Jesus has done for us as our substitute, as the conquering Lion of Judah.
should I gain? Why should I gain from his reward? For nothing that we've done. I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart. Things have made my Be thou my vision. best thought. May that be our prayer on Sundays, every day as the people of God. Just as Mike was saying, Pastor Mike, beautifully calling us to serve as God's people, to find some aspect to be involved in the lives of others. That's what God's calling us to do, not through our own strength, not through our own abilities or just our creativity, but through his spirit. Amen? All right, let's, let's close together. Now, may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.